Hello everybody, I'm uh, going to be talking about um, the environment in Minnesota for a bit. Uh, some maps from our textbook, as you can see I just took pictures of these maps. Uh, what do you see here? You see uh, how much precipitation we have. Uh, it tends to be more on the eastern side of the state than the western side. Uh, part of that is uh, what we've talked about, lake effect snow, especially in the north there. Um, but you can also see different types of forests uh, versus tall grass prairie. Uh, there's a certain amount of, of precipitation that's needed for larger and larger biomass to basically develop and to grow. And so uh, if you have a thick forest, you're going to need a lot more precipitation. Uh, then you get a thinner forest, and then if you get less precipitation, uh, you get tall grass prairie, even less precipitation, you get short grass prairie. Uh, yeah, that's good for, for that. Um, something to keep in mind, the vegetation at time of public land survey, you can see that's a big range of dates there. Uh, well, that's because, uh, well, this, this survey was taken into account after uh, a bunch of different uh, new species were being introduced, uh, European species of uh, trees and plants and grasses and all kinds of stuff. Um, so this is kind of a, a mixture. You might think of the public land survey uh, as, as being what the vegetation was like uh, before there was any European uh, involvement in the region, uh, but it's, it's closer to that than it is to what it is today. <clears throat> Um, oh, one other thing I want to talk about, basically some of the types of um, water resources we have in Minnesota. Water resources, right? We have lots of water resources, uh, fresh water, not just uh, lakes, but in our rivers. You can see worldwide, uh, it's a pretty precious commodity and growing increasingly uh, precious by the day. Uh, Minnesota gets a lot of its water uh, from a wide area, even uh, neighboring states. Um, their water eventually, even if it's underground, it flows over here to the Mississippi uh, and to the Minnesota River, uh, a couple of our main rivers over here. <clears throat> Sorry, this clicker seems to be broken. All right. Uh, just some examples of uh, if maybe you've ever been hiking and you see water it seems to kind of come out of nowhere from uh, the side of the ground. Uh, that's very often, uh, well, water that is as a, a perched water table, if it uh, can't quite go through, um, as you can see in this example, impermeable bed of clay, uh, then you'll see little streams coming out the sides of the hillside and whatnot. So these eventually do go down to uh, the water table Um, in the west side of our state especially, uh, although we, as I said, we have lots of fresh water compared to plenty of other places, uh, the drier side of the state has been having some wells run dry. You can see how this happens if your neighbor has a well that's deeper than yours. Uh, you could bring down the water table so that it will make uh, other wells that may have been running for a long time run dry. It doesn't mean you don't have any water resources, but it does mean that everybody, everyone is then forced to also uh, go further down. Um, the, the old growth forests uh, had a lot of biodiversity, right? Uh, and now, of course, we have mostly monocultures. Uh, an example being, you know, if you're out driving and there's uh, acres and acres of, of corn, right, monoculture. Uh, what that means is, um, although there was farming before European settlement here in Minnesota, uh, it was more subsistence level, uh, and often it would be more kind of uh, in step with nature, right? So you'd have actually different plants growing uh, in the same area, uh, and sometimes you would have uh, aspects of that ecosystem adding to the soils. Uh, whereas now uh, with monocultures, well, you don't really have uh, a lot of a lot of things being added unless you directly add it. So now we uh, put a whole bunch of fertilizer on the land to try to make up for the fact that we've kind of destroyed these ecosystems that used to 
have complex ways to break down nutrients for other plants uh, to, to consume. Um, again, just another example of how we get some of our water from uh, neighboring states. Uh, sometimes these are uh, quite a bit uh, of distance. Um, if you've ever heard of an artesian well, um, that is a well that is under pressure, so when that well goes in, you'll usually get a, a burst of water coming up. Uh, lots of lakes and streams, of course, in Minnesota, uh, and those lakes and streams, uh, well, they actually are much more mobile uh, than, than we usually kind of think of them as, and that's for a number of different reasons. Uh, their mobility uh, is a slow process uh, and also we have put a lot of kind of concrete and things in place to try to keep them from from flowing around as much as they normally would um, let's see here uh, well our rivers uh, have kinetic energy in them, right? Kinetic energy, meaning that they are picking up stuff as they move. The faster the water moves, the more stuff it picks up. And so through time, you have major land movements, um, and uh, usually in a natural process, you'll have streams uh, meander and then break their meanders and jump over different borders and whatnot. <clears throat> uh, again, just to give you an idea, this is the Mississippi watershed. Uh, as you can see, it's a pretty large uh, area that drains all out to the Mississippi. Uh, we've talked about the different falls here in Minnesota. Um, you know, the reason that St. Anthony Falls is a center of industry uh, is because, well, that, that moving water is, as I said, kinetic energy. Uh, and so that energy can be used in uh, manufacturing uh, and obviously in milling uh, here in Minnesota. Um, usually those falls, uh, they wear that rock down uh, and those areas will be moving backwards. So seeing how the falls itself uh, was very well measured in its process of, of moving uh, upstream uh, until, well, until there was a, a great big uh, landslide uh, and a whole new concrete area was built around it. Uh, this is just a simple process of measuring the speed the water's going by and the volume and then you look in the water to, you can take a sample to see how much actual stuff is being conveyed by the water. This water looks pretty clear, so probably not as much stuff uh, being conveyed. Um, and you don't need to know the specific math of how much uh, energy is in this. Just know that falling water uh, does have energy. Um, when flooding happens, I know flooding has been in the news a lot lately, uh, there's a lot more that happens besides the water actual damage. It's usually uh, the debris and stuff that is picked up by the water that is then just left in different areas. Uh, it's, it's a messy cleanup, but also the actual mud uh, and, and even rocks and, and other stuff that's in debris can really smash a place up. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, the larger the object, the less it's going to move, but it will still often move more than zero. It'll just be a, a slower amount of time. So uh, if you've ever been inner tubing down the Apple River, for example, you might uh, sometimes hit some, some smooth round rocks. You might even notice that those rocks are sometimes moving along with you. Uh, it's a slow process. Uh, this is an example of, uh, well, a stream that actually has a, a very high uh, load content. Uh, you can see it has lots of lots of material in it, right? And all that material uh, accumulates in all kinds of different ways. Sometimes it accumulates in little sandbars. Basically, uh, if you can look at this example, any place that the water would be slowed down, so let's say it hits a, a tree that's grown or something, uh, if it's slowed down, uh, it loses its kinetic energy and it will drop the stuff that it's carrying with it because it doesn't have the energy to carry it anymore. So you could have a stream, a part of it that just hits a little tree and it starts dropping off material. All of a sudden, uh, that little tree becomes a whole sandbar. Sandbars can uh, accumulate through time, uh, becoming uh, entire flood plains through time, and the river itself can uh, perhaps completely change where it's going 
And these are all very natural processes, but processes that we, we want stable land uses. And so these are usually things we've, we've tried to put a, a stop to uh, with very mixed success uh, because there's certain amounts of kind of natural extreme weather events that happen that, um, that uh, well, no amount of planning can really compensate for. Uh, this is some examples of some meandering streams. Uh, this is actually a, a number of the lakes we have, although we talked before about them being put in here uh, during the Ice Age. Uh, a number of lakes are actually streams that have uh, perhaps wound their way around. Uh, you'll have, um, you can see this pattern of erosion and how you could have a stream slowly meanders through time because as it uh, hits one side of that area, uh, the bank erosion, that area, it's picking up the material, right? But on the inside area, it's dropping off material. It's picking up material as it hits that bend because it's speeding up, and then it's slowing down as it hits uh, the other area, uh, your sediment uh, area. Uh, just another graphic representation of that process of how, how rivers move. Um, so this example here of an oxbow lake, this was a, a meander that cut itself off. Uh, you can see meander scar there, different kind of uh, land formations that we'll see near, near the many major rivers that we have here. And then at the bottom, uh, I showed you how the stream, the Mississippi was carrying all that material. Uh, it, it dumps it all out. Rivers dump that material all out on uh, deltas. Uh, and this is the Mississippi Delta where all that material uh, goes out from Minnesota. Um, we have a number of different ways to monitor precipitation uh, and weather, uh, specifically precipitation. You can see these uh, little uh, US Geological Survey monitors. Uh, what do they tell us? They often uh, try to warn us about different extreme weather events. Uh, it may seem uh, pretty logical that you could have uh, a precipitation event, meaning a great big rainfall. And well, I, I, after that rainfall, you can often get water. It takes time to eventually accumulate into uh, there are areas that are going if like they're going to flood or going to a floodplain. Uh, but if you measure the precipitation, you can then uh, calculate um, how much of a flood is it going to be? Is it going to be something we're going to worry about? This is why you get warnings before the actual floods happen because uh, we can measure rain when it happens. And we in general know the flow of water. Um, although we're always making problems for ourselves by making more and more area that doesn't drain well, uh, say cities, for example, uh, structures, uh, concrete pavement, uh, the water, as you can imagine, just runs right off. Uh, and we're making more and more of those through time. Uh, a number of places, of course, will put in big dams. Uh, this is a, a lot of different reasons. Part of the reason is you can make a, a big storage area of lots of water for all kinds of uses, uh, but it also, the hope is, makes it so that uh, things like a flood um, maybe would not would not affect others further downstream. Uh, and this is just an example of what I was talking about about how we're making more and more land surfaces um, unable to absorb water. Water just quickly runs off of it, and we try to put in uh, a lot of ways for that water to to kind of get out of the way. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, I mentioned some of these things before. European settlers uh, began, began changing the vegetation uh, basically as soon as they got here, uh, started bringing in things uh, from Europe. A um, lot of that, that original biodiversity uh, was plowed under. Uh, as, as you know, many of the, the woods were cut for very, very valuable timber. Um, well, they're... they're when a lot of that timber was cut, there's lots of uh, scrap and stuff that's left over. Uh, and very often the, the people who were cutting the wood really didn't care about the long term, what was happening on that land. Uh, sometimes it'd be land that they didn't even own that they'd be cutting wood down. Uh, but all that stuff that would be remaining there, if it wasn't cleared off, 
uh, could easily catch fire and often did. Uh, fire isn't an unnatural thing. Uh, in fact, a number of ecosystems need regular fires to kind of clear it out. Uh, trees have adopted to this sometimes by having thicker bark. Um, jack pine, which was a very popular uh, breed of tree for lumber. Um, well, their uh, cones actually to, to shed their seeds, they need fire, although straight sunlight and a hot day can do it too. Uh, well, one of the few areas that you can actually go to that has some of these extensive old growth forests that have the old, uh, all the different types of vegetation involved uh, are in the uh, Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Uh, a lot of you have probably been there. Um, you know, in our state, uh, leaves change color in fall, right? Uh, loss of chlorophyll. Sorry, uh, this clicker's not working. Okay. Um, I already said this as well, actually, about moisture content. Uh, this is just an example of uh, grass prairie. Uh, you've probably, probably have seen a grass prairie before. Uh, I should also mention when it comes to soils, we're pretty near the level of kind of uh, equal neutral amount of, uh, well, as you can see in the map, acidity versus alkaline, um, kind, of, kind of right through the state. Uh, let's see, our book also talks a lot about a lot, a lot of different types of soils, soils that have their different soil horizons. Uh, as you can see, well, this soil doesn't have really great horizon to it. Uh, I would say the main, this is uh, the type of soil you'd see in a desert. As you can see, there's not a lot uh, uh, for the, the plants to kind of grab onto. Oh yeah, so this is the type of soil that's extensively discussed uh, in this chapter, Molosols. Uh As you can see, uh, that black color is a very, very rich, very valuable type of soil. This is the type of soil that people were uh, coming to Minnesota to try to utilize on a large mass-produced basis. And of course, not all the state has these great soils. There's plenty of places that have soils that are much more sandy and have different problems to rocky. Um, uh, well, again, just some other types of soils just to show you by comparison. <clears throat> uh, early farming days, there's lots of soil erosion. Um, wasn't really a lot of uh, thought given to to uh, how soil could be uh, worn away pretty quickly. Uh, sometimes if you see different patterns in different farms in the farmland, those are efforts to try to make it so that you have different crops that you're rotating. Uh, that tries to simulate, you know, you, you would plant uh, legumes, uh, which would uh, put nitrogen into the soil, nitrogen being a good fertilizer, and then you plant something that uses, that needs that nitrogen. Um, this is kind of the closest we can do to, to uh, copying the environment uh, before uh, sellers came. All right.